Good evening. I'm Susan Ormiston, and this is The National. If we could get one guy out of the basement, one guy who's thinking about harming himself. For the first time, wounded warriors from 17 countries gather in Canada to find solace in the games founded by Prince Harry. His mother would be proud of him. North Korea slams Donald Trump with a strange and personal insult and talks about testing an H-bomb. Suddenly, homeless and sleeping in front of their homes, it is too risky to go in. Plus, violence on the rise in the name of fighting fascists. It's an escalating arms race, fasten your seatbelts. For a week, Canada is playing host to a major competition. Athletes are pouring in from around the world, celebrities too. But the driving motivation for all this is not glory, it's healing. The Invictus Games begin tomorrow in Toronto, and the man behind it, Prince Harry, is already in town. As Rene Filipponi reports, for the wounded warriors competing, Harry's presence means everything. For some, the battle wounds are visible while for others they are harder to see. But everyone here has scars from serving their country. It's been the uh, last nine months training for this and uh, I'm, out of the, I'm out of the basement. My, uh, I'm out of my comfort zone that the doctor said I had to get out of. Robert Smith doesn't share details about his trauma, but says being a part of the Invictus Games gives him back a sense of camaraderie. If we could get one guy out of the basement, one guy who's thinking about harming himself to not and, and do this. And that's what motivated Prince Harry to launch the Invictus Games in 2014. He spent time today poolside and courtside. His own experience serving in Afghanistan with the British Army sparked his advocacy for injured veterans, a group he believes deserves more respect. To have a royal to, to start something like this, it's uh, awe-inspiring to all of us. And his mother would be proud of him. We've got 17 nations, 550 competitors, eight days of competition, 12 sports. This is the third Invictus Games, the first time in Canada, putting veterans front and center at a time when Ottawa continues to be criticized for not doing enough to support them. We really do hope that what comes out of this after the games are gone is that Canadians continue to remember the struggles of our military and veteran families and step up to support them, whether it's through funding or recognition in some other way. They've been involved in a lot of uh, challenges uh, operationally, uh, life and death situations, watching friends die just a matter of, of making peace with all that. Brian Clark spent decades as a diver in the Canadian Navy. For him, it's not about who wins or loses or the competition at all. Hopefully, when I uh, go back to Victoria, I can encourage some of my friends that are also experiencing the same uh, challenges from their career uh, transitioning to civilian life. Instead, it's a chance to share their stories and remind us all of the sheer simple power of the human spirit. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. And we had the opportunity to speak with the co-captains of Team Canada a few days ago during preparations for the Invictus Games. And next week, we'll share their personal stories of war and recovery. A bomb is, is nothing like we see in the movies. It's not a big flame. It's just a big pressure heat wave in your face. And that's all I remember from the event itself. To that, I woke up. Um, first thing you do is a pat check. You check what you got and... Long and behold, there's something missing. You suddenly realize, you know, it must be a dream or something like that, but uh, it's not, and you gotta realize that. I was a crazy man, I wanted to go back to Afghanistan on one leg. Uh, just, you know, saying it out loud sounds a bit crazy. I'll have that story Monday for you on The National. U.S. President Donald Trump has a penchant for insults. His favorite now for North Korea's Kim Jong-un is... Rocket Man, just listen to him at a rally tonight in Alabama. And by the way, Rocket Man should have been handled a long time ago. <laughs> but I'm gonna handle it because we have to handle it. Little Rocket Man, we, we're gonna do it because we really have no choice. 
Today, the North Korean leader himself joined in the schoolyard taunt, launching a personal insult against Trump of his own. More might find it funny if not for the fact that between them, they can incinerate, irradiate, and obliterate millions. Lindsay Duncombe has that story. The most unusual thing about Kim Jong-un's latest threats and insults read on state television is that this was a personal statement in his own words directly aimed at Donald Trump. Kim promised to tame the, quote, mentally deranged daughtered with fire. Daughtered is a translation of a Korean insult roughly meaning senile idiot. More specifically, his foreign minister said the regime is planning to test a hydrogen bomb over the Pacific, something the U.S. isn't sure North Korea has the capacity to do, but officials admit would be a game-changing escalation if attempted. It's no all because of this, Donald totally Trump's speech to the U.N. earlier this week. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. And Trump is sticking to his tactic of name-calling. On Twitter this morning, calling Kim a madman who doesn't mind starving or killing his own people. Okay, Not Trump wise, say experts. First thing I'd say to, uh, uh, to, to the President Trump is don't make it worse. Stop the tweets, start, stop the insults, and, and then start moving from there. And from Russia, a scolding. We have to calm the hotheads, that country's foreign minister said at the U.N. There are diplomatic moves happening, too. Most significantly, new American sanctions giving the U.S. power to seize the assets of any company doing business with North Korea. If they don't have the funding for the ballistic missiles, for the nuclear production, then they can do less of it. China is key to the success of sanctions. It has been stepping up cooperation with the U.N. so far, but it's unclear how much further it will go towards isolating the regime. The reality is North Korea has experience getting around sanctions. Some say with China's help, the best hope for these latest restrictions is that they hurt enough to bring North Korea to the bargaining table. Judging by Kim's statement today, that's a long shot. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. And as Lindsay mentioned, if they could actually do it, detonating a hydrogen bomb in the Pacific would be a serious escalation and a clear demonstration of the destructive power Pyongyang might possess. For comparison, what was used on Hiroshima was an atom bomb. If it was dropped on Vancouver, everyone in this circle would suffer third-degree radiation burns at a minimum. A hydrogen bomb is far more sophisticated, up to a thousand times more destructive. North Korea claimed it detonated an H-bomb earlier this month, but that test was underground and hard to verify. A blast in the Pacific would prove its claims beyond any doubt. The U.S., the U.K., and France did several nuclear tests in the Pacific. The ecological impact was devastating. A U.S. test, for example, did near irreversible damage to the Bikini Atoll. It remains deserted more than 60 years later. Japan, the only country to suffer a nuclear attack, called North Korea's threats today absolutely unacceptable. Other U.S. allies in the region are also rattled. Perhaps no one stands to lose more from war than South Korea. CBC's Asia correspondent Sasha Petrasik is in Seoul and tells us that this latest round of threats is having a deeper impact than usual. When it comes to threats from the north, South Koreans tend to be a lot less concerned than you might expect. In fact, some people might even consider them complacent. They feel like they've seen all this before. But this week's war of words does seem to have put people more on edge. It's not so much because of new threats from Kim Jong-un, but rather it's because of the strong, stark words from Donald Trump. Of the two, they consider him to be much more unpredictable, much more likely to do something that's going to lead to war. And despite Washington's assurances that it won't launch any sort of military attack in the north without consulting Seoul, this government here, well, people here in the front lines simply don't believe that, most of them. There's one other thing that's notable about today. The fact that Kim Jong-un delivered his comments personally and spoke almost directly to Donald Trump is highly significant. He hardly ever gives speeches anymore. People in North Korea have come to think of him as almost above that. 
In fact, when I was in North Korea a few months ago, he attended several major events, big national holidays, but he didn't say a single word publicly. So when he does, he carries a lot of weight. In fact, it almost always becomes government policy. Today's comments are that much more significant. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Seoul. Coming up. Condoms don't cut it, unfortunately. Ontario moves to reduce new HIV infections by helping cover the cost of preventative drugs. Plus, who gets to define what it means to be German? It's a key question in the looming election. The islands of Turks and Caicos felt the lash of Hurricane Maria today, but the storm, a Category 3, is expected to lose some of its strength over the weekend. Maria has already left at least 30 people dead across the Caribbean two days after it made landfall in Puerto Rico. The U.S. territory remains shattered. Streets are flooded. Thousands of homes have been destroyed. More than two months still remain in the Atlantic hurricane season. To Mexico City, where time is running out for anyone trapped in the rubble of Tuesday's earthquake. As the number of dead continues to climb, rescue work gives way to recovery. And across the capital, the extent of the damage is still being assessed. But it's clear that thousands have lost their homes. The CBC's Kim Brunhuber is there. Welcome to the Oso Mayor, a 14-story apartment building in downtown Mexico City. For 12 years, Adriana Lemos has walked up to apartment 903 until Tuesday. Close to 40 buildings in the city have collapsed entirely, but 4,000 are damaged, like this one, many beyond repair. I ask her if she feels safe. No, she says, we have to be careful. She shouldn't be in here, of course. The authorities have forbidden residents from going in. From the outside, you can see why. The building is coming apart at the seams, half of it leaning wearily as though it would prefer to lie down. And it looks even worse inside. Parts of the building are just not there anymore. The stairs have separated from the floor. We have to step over spaces or use the fallen siding as a bridge. Naturally, no electricity. All this to pick up some of her six-year-old daughter's favorite things. Residents gathered outside wondering what to do, where to go. Buildings are still falling. Francisco Flores fears theirs could be next. A little earthquake or something, and maybe that could finish the job, you know. Most in this working-class neighborhood have little money and few options. Some are staying at a shelter that's been set up down the street. Others have chosen to sleep in their cars. Here comes Vivian Rodriguez's morning coffee, served to her by a volunteer. The front seat is her kitchen and her bedroom. That open wound in the bricks, that was her home. She could stay in a shelter, she says, but she and many others prefer to sleep close enough to see their homes. So people don't rob us of the little we have, she says. Soldiers are here to keep order, but Rodriguez says the government is doing little else to help the suddenly homeless. Back at the Oso Mayor, Lemos is donating one of her doors. A neighbor is helping her build a bridge for other residents trickling in to retrieve a garbage bag or two of belongings. Vital documents, a favorite sweater, whatever they cherish most, whatever they feel they'll need to get them through this. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Mexico City. Wow. The other thing that comes with disasters appeals for help. And in these turbulent times, the risk of donor fatigue is especially acute. So aid agencies are taking steps to avoid it. Cameron McIntosh has the details. In San Juan, Puerto Rico, the mayor spent her day boating through the streets, assessing the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. The latest in a string of storms that devastated much of the Caribbean and parts of the U.S., as help arrives for yet untold numbers of people left injured and homeless. Aid is also pouring into Mexico in the aftermath of this week's deadly earthquake. A rare confluence of large-scale natural disasters in North America forcing some aid agencies like UNICEF Canada to put out an emergency call for help. We do our, our emergency fundraising when these big disasters strike and when they're covered by the media. UNICEF Canada did the same thing after the 2010 Haiti earthquake, raising $5 million in three days. Now it's trying to raise $4.6 million for Mexico. 
But factor in the hurricanes and many other ongoing humanitarian campaigns, such as Syria and the current refugee situation in Myanmar. There's a lot of demand for the aid dollar. At a time when Canadians saw a need in their own backyard this summer, donating $19 million to the Canadian Red Cross during the BC forest fires. Many in the aid community concede there are a lot of asks out there. We are inundated with these disaster pitches. When you have one disaster, it can galvanize the donor community. When you have multiple disasters, it can paralyze. A concern that has some organizations like World Vision changing strategy, focusing on appeals to aid regions rather than individual disasters. Perhaps it's best for us to combine our efforts and uh, actually have a common appeal. Where the actual threshold is, isn't clear. History has shown Canadians donate more in years where there are more big disasters, international and domestic. Right now at UNICEF, the phones are still ringing. We see that people want to step up and they want to help. With so many causes out there right now, would-be donors are advised to do a little research and ask questions about how and where their money is going to be spent in order to be confident it's going where it's needed to go. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Uber is in another big fight, about to lose its operating license in one of the world's largest cities over concerns around safety and security. I want London to be at the forefront of innovation and new technology, but you've got to play by the rules. London punished the ride-hailing company for failing to report serious criminal offences and for deceiving regulators. 40,000 drivers will be affected and Uber is appealing. In Quebec, Uber will stay on the road, but with stricter rules, the province has given the company permission to operate for another year if drivers get the same background checks and training as traditional taxi drivers. It hasn't been that long since an HIV diagnosis was essentially a death sentence. Advanced drugs have since saved millions of lives, and some of those same medications can also be used to prevent HIV in the first place. But they usually come with a crushing cost. That is about to change. For many people in Ontario, Vic Adopia explains. Truvada was first used to treat people infected with HIV. Clinical trials show it can also be used to prevent it, with a 90% success rate if taken daily. So my partner was positive. For Yannick Picard, Truvada was out of reach. Until recently, it was $1,000 a month. Too much for his private drug plan. Starting next week, the government of Ontario will pay for it, as new, cheaper, generic versions of Truvada hit the market. What it would do is that it would just make something um, that is actually, uh, could, pr could prove to be uh, life-altering. There are side effects which can range from nausea to liver or kidney damage. Travada doesn't protect against other sexually transmitted infections, so prescribing doctors must continue to urge patients to use condoms as part of an HIV reduction strategy. Over the past decade, new cases of HIV in Ontario have dropped by a quarter, in part because of those strategies. But those advances have stagnated in the past few years. But in clinical trials... That's why this infectious disease specialist says the province needed to step up. If we have the potential to prevent HIV, it's the morally right thing to do. But also, number two, it's also the cost-effective thing to do. So it is far cheaper to prevent HIV infections than it is to actually treat HIV infections. Even though the cost of the drug has come down, this pharmacist says it's still out of reach for some. I primarily serve gay men here in Toronto. Many are students, many are unemployed. How are they going to pay for $300 every month for medication? The generic version of Travada won't be free to everyone who wants it. They'll have to apply to a special program and still might not be able to afford the deductible. Activists warn that could put the drug out of reach for those who need it the most. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. And straight ahead, British Prime Minister Theresa May drops big news about Brexit and we go where else to a British pub to see who's listening. Nine royal babies have been born here at St. Mary's Hospital. So Londoners knew where to come when news came this morning that the princess was in the early stages of labor. It is a boy. Henry Charles Albert David, or just Harry for short. 
That's what Prince Charles and Diana decided to name their new son. Franny was christened in this. Great, great. Great, Franny. At times, they appear quite natural, jumping up to peer through lookout lenses, tossing coins into the falls. But British reporters say Diana is carefully grooming her sons for royal duties. They know the royal routine for accepting gifts, admire it for a few seconds, then pass it to an attendant. On Diana's coffin draped with the royal standard, there were three reads. One from her younger son, Harry, said simply, Mummy. Today, Harry, prince of the realm and offspring of Charles, heir to the throne, came home from Eton, his boarding school, to ride out the storm. Ironically, just down the road is the pub where he reportedly drank to excess at the age of 16 last summer. He also smoked marijuana with friends at Highgrove, the Prince of Wales residence. Staff smelled the telltale smoke. Hello, love. Prince Charles carefully controls all media access to his two sons, and these pictures, released on Prince Harry's 18th birthday, are no exception. He turned down the offer of an 18th royal birthday bash, saying, I don't actually like being the center of attention. He wants to be considered just another soldier. He's not. Prince Harry the Wild Child is now being seen by his nation in a whole new way, a hard-working soldier. Well, for all the defiance that Britain showed in its referendum to quit the European Union once and for all today, Prime Minister Theresa May was actually asking EU leaders for more time to make that transition. How do Brexit's biggest fans feel about all that? The CBC's Thomas Digg went to find out. In England, Brexit has a heartland. And this is it. Rugeley, Staffordshire County, a world away from cosmopolitan London. Here, like the Pints, Brexit is an easy sell. We're going to be better off from it all, because we won't be dictated like we have been from Europe. Too many people are coming into this country, and it's a small country, we can't handle that. We ain't backing down from nothing now. It's, it's called democracy. The Prime Minister may be talking Brexit on TV, but she doesn't get half the attention that he does. Got it? Yeah. Tim Martin, the pub owner with rock star status, a self-made millionaire who sees Brexit as a blessing, not the economic disaster that was predicted. So everyone said it was going to be terrible, it's been good, and that's been true of us. We've had record sales, record profits. People here want a taste of that success, and they find jobs hard to come by. Rugeley's power plant closed last year, that didn't help. They see Brexit as the solution. For their troubles, people here blame others, bureaucrats in Brussels, or especially immigrants. So says this councillor who voted against Brexit. I think there are too many immigrants in the area, but uh, around here it's 98% white British. It's, uh, it's still the biggest concern. Knowing those concerns, the British Prime Minister pulled up in Florence. Theresa May left home to deliver news Brexiteers may not want to hear. Her speech meant instead to reassure EU leaders. It will take time to put in place the new immigration system required to retake control of the UK's borders. An extra two years, in fact, past the original goal of March 2019. That's how long she expects the so-called transition period will last. European citizens will still be allowed to work in Britain, but they'll have to register. And the UK will still pay into the EU budget. Not the clean break people here hoped for, especially not Tim Martin. The two-year delay, which might end up derailing it, I think it might risk derailing Brexit itself. For now, there's no shortage of ale and plenty of hope around Brexit. Question is how their dream will compare to reality. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Rugeley, England. Germans have their own hopes and dreams for the future and a lot of the same concerns. Angela Merkel is betting that she knows her people well enough to win a fourth term as chancellor. With Germany's election just two days away, Margaret Evans takes us to one of Merkel's final campaign stops. 
It might not look like it, but this sleepy German town on the Baltic coast is getting ready to welcome the new leader of the free world, or so she's often dubbed. Angela Merkel came to Wismar on a swing through the region in this final week of electioneering. Her message to the waiting crowds is straightforward. No new taxes, the need for a port town to diversify, and a thank you to volunteers who've helped refugees, some of whom are in the crowd. And then it's a wrap. And all is, all is beautiful. So Angela Merkel has just finished speaking. It hasn't been the most dynamic campaign event I've ever attended, but that's what Angela Merkel is marketing. Stability, smooth sailing, no bumps. Both decided and undecided tend to see Merkel as a safe pair of hands, especially during such uncertain times. The choir says North Korea is the issue that keeps them up at night. No more war, says this man. Merkel knows exactly what she wants, says a woman called Elke, and she's very level-headed. I like that. Not everyone does, though. Hecklers chanting Merkel must go dog most of her campaign events. This no exception. They're backing the far-right Alternative for Germany party, which has played on fears of foreigners in posters like these, bikinis, not burkas, or new Germans, we'll make them ourselves. In Berlin, a small but determined group of AFD supporters protests outside Merkel's chancellery every Wednesday, streaming their efforts online. If the polls are right, the AFD could enter the Bundestag, the first time for a far-right party to do so since the 1950s. It's also tapping into a nationalism rarely on display in German politics because of the country's Nazi history. That's the past of, of my father and of my grandfather, but it's not my past. I look in the future and I don't want a country that's run over by the Islam. The gold, red and black of the German flag float through Angela Merkel's election campaign too. Her strategists hired one of Hamburg's hippest and most successful ad agencies. Not like we are German and Germany first, but we could have the ownership of what is Germany all about and we could take that space from the far right to the middle to Angela Merkel. Thomas Strayrath says the inspiration was the year Germany hosted the World Cup back in 2006. It was the first time that the Germans fall in love with their country again and that was not like a proud or hard thing, like a national thing, but that was like a, yeah, like we felt like a global country because the, the whole world uh, was visiting us. And Angela Merkel is still basking in that feel-good factor, her campaign slogan reading, where we live well and where we like to live. Whether it remains that way with a potentially more fractured and fractious parliament in the offing is another matter. Margaret Evans, CBC News in Wismar northern Germany. And from Germany to the U.S., coming up next, the rise of violence on the far left. When the Grand Dragon fell to the ground and was descended upon with kicks to the head and, and various weapons, I, in a split second I saw that nobody was going to help him. Why the anti-fascist movement is breaking out weapons. Plus, to tip or not to tip, sometimes it's not your choice. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX edged down slightly. The Canadian dollar increased a tenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost nine points and the price of oil bumped up 11 cents a barrel. This is sodium silico fluoride, photographed in Brantford, where fluoridation has been used since 1945. It is said to be able to reduce tooth decay by 60%. At this moment, almost 32 million people in North America are drinking fluoridated water. Now, Dr. Dunn, is it true or false that sodium fluoride is a basic ingredient in rat poison? I think it's fair to say that sodium fluoride is contained in a rat poison, and I think it's also fair to say that it's contained in teeth. There are no deleterious effects to the human being 
drinking fluoridated water. Anne Burton, president of Ontario Citizens' Rights Association, has been campaigning against water fluoridation for over 20 years. I'm just amazed that the general public can believe that you can treat the human body through the water supply, using the water supply as the vehicle to carry that treatment for a disease like tooth decay, which is neither waterborne nor contagious. Water fluoridation is an issue that's been debated repeatedly. Some people think it's time to take another look at it. What I'm concerned about is that if we're using fluoride from so many different sources, now we may be overexposing the body to the amounts of fluoride and eventually ending up probably with mottled teeth. Yeah, very nice Those patches are called fluorosis, a condition that shocks many parents because of the cause. Too much fluoride when Braden was a preschooler. We don't really know just how much fluoride it takes uh, to cause a little fluorosis. And uh, it's something we didn't really know too much about 10 years ago. It's well known that fluoride helps prevent tooth decay. But there's a growing awareness that Canadian children may be getting too much fluoride from too many sources. Well, it's like anything, you, you can have too much of a good thing. Fluoridated water still remains the most equitable, most economic way of, provi of providing a preventive agent for dental care to the general population. Practically all major health organizations in North America have endorsed fluoridation as an effective and safe way to reduce dental decay. reporter, Basil Lake, the radio editor of the Star, came up to me and said, you have another job tonight, you're going to broadcast the hockey game. Uh, apparently they had canvassed the entire sports department to get somebody to do it, and uh, for some reason or other, no one was available. Hockey night in Canada. Tonight, Toronto Maple Leafs and New York Rangers. Play by play by Foster Hewitt out at center, one nothing for the Toronto Maple Leafs over the New York Rangers as Nestorenko fires a shot from well out. I think hockey is the greatest game there is. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically excitement. Uh, there's bodily contact, there's danger, uh, not to the viewer but to the uh, participant. But it has about everything that helps to create a, a thrill in the minds of of the uh, spectator. That's Ward taken, Ward against both. Here's Wetter right and he shoots, he scores! Broadcasting has been my life. It's given me the opportunity to travel all over our country and to meet some very wonderful people. I get a kick out of going west every year, visiting small localities. You meet all types, and they speak to you as if they've known you all their lives. This is a real big thrill, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Hello, Canada, and hockey fans in the United States. We're at the eight-minute mark. There's no score. There's a shot. Oh! And the right in on the net as a drive from the left side by Nastarenko slid in off Sawchuk's skate. The summer is over, and in the U.S., it's been one of the most violent political periods in recent memory. Rallies routinely ending in fistfights or worse. Take Charlottesville, Virginia, where a far-right demonstrator is accused of killing one person and injuring 19 others. But recently, attention has turned to the Antifa, a movement on the left willing to fight fire with fire at a time when the temperature in America is rising fast. Rage and resolve, displays of force. Protest politics in the U.S. have changed, and not just on the right. In late August in Berkeley, California, images of violence against right-wing demonstrators earned the black-clad Antifa a surge of notoriety. Across the political spectrum, revulsion. Berkeley's mayor, a Democrat, called for a crackdown. I think we should classify them as a gang. You know, they come dressed in, in uniforms, they have weapons, they're almost a militia. 
And I think we need to think about that in terms of our law enforcement approach. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. Donald Trump has equated the left wing Antifa with the violent far right, saying it shares the blame for the fatal violence in Charlottesville, Virginia. You know, they show up in the helmets and the black masks, and they've got clubs and they've got everything. Antifa! But today's Antifa is in part a product of the Trump era. Antifa, in its very literal sense, you know, really means anti-fascism. So my name is Will Carlos. I'm a correspondent with Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, and I cover extremism in America, and I've actually been covering the Antifa movement, the rise of the Antifa movement, for several months now. What we're seeing today with the discussion in, in, in the left about whether or not to embrace this movement, whether or not to denounce this violence, is something that's happened time and time and time again in the history of anti-fascism. Antifa has a very long uh, history going back to the 1920s and 1930s in Europe. Right at the birth of fascism, there were, there were groups of thousands of people who organized to sort of fight the birth of fascism. <laughs> It rose again in the 1980s and early 90s in North America, including in Canada, as anti-racism groups responded to neo-Nazis. After that, Antifa largely receded into the background. And then it sort of starts to come back, I think it's fair to say, with really the election of Donald Trump. You can't have anti-fascists without fascists. And while Donald Trump disavows the far right, since his rise, it has become more visible and active. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And sometimes confronted. In February of 2016, uh, the Ku Klux Klan was going to march in Orange County. And we haven't seen Klan activity of that kind in coastal Southern California in many years. So I went to that rally to uh, take stock, to do some interviews, do some research, but it didn't quite go as planned. It's done! Get away, get away, get away, get away! Get away, get away, get away, get away from this gentleman! Get... So uh, when the Grand Dragon fell to the ground and was descended upon with kicks to the head and, and various weapons, um, I, in a split second, I saw that nobody was going to help him, and it was either that or, or have his life significantly at risk. Sir, don't hurt him! Don't hurt him! It made him an unlikely hero for a neo-Nazi website. Yes, the Daily Stormer labeled me the Jewish Batman. For Brian Levin, the link between Trump and political violence is crystal clear. I'm not saying that President Trump is a dyed-in-the-wool racist. I don't know what's in his heart. But what I will say, his charisma, his notoriety, and his messaging was one where folks on that fringe extreme felt that even if they couldn't get into the opera house, had someone who would at least play some of their sheet music. David Duke endorsed me? Okay. All right. I disavow, okay? We're going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for Donald Trump. Bottom line is, we have a normalization of political violence which preceded candidate and President Trump, but his accession as a charismatic, very widely known leader has amped it up to a level that we haven't seen in decades. U.S. government data reveal a long record of homicides inspired by far-right extremism. 106 people died in 62 attacks from 2001 to the end of 2016. Far-left groups over that same period caused no fatalities. We are going to start history all over again. A new generation on the far right is eager to shed its extremist image, often disavowing violence, packaging racist ideology in new terminology, in an attempt to enter as far into the mainstream as possible. The most radical thing for anyone to say is, I am white. My life has meaning. Messaging has become more blurred where hate groups are communicating to me saying, uh, we're identitarians, we're not, uh, we're not uh, supremacists. Uh, but the bottom line is, 
It's the same cornflakes in a different box. I understand it looks like a Nazi outfit, um, but I mean, you can say a lot about the Nazis, but they look pretty good. For the more politically savvy far right, the Antifa serves as a boogeyman, invoked for unity and leveraged for sympathy. We will not allow leftist militant activist organizations like Antifa go to these kind of events and hinder our constitutional right to free speech and assembly. But among activists on the left, its prominence is new. At the early parts of this year, really the only way that Antifa was being talked about in any significant sense was it was being defined by the far right. It was very difficult to find anybody who would proactively sort of go on record as saying, I am Antifa, and because at that point it was being so defined by the far right. Then Charlottesville happened. Charlottesville was really a, a seminal moment for America's far right. It was seen very much as a show of force. That's what victory looks like! We know a lot about the planning, funnily enough, because they were doing, uh, most of the, the organizers were doing the planning on, a, on an app that was actually developed for gamers. And there was a leak. Not only was there planning in terms of militancy, but there was a whole lot of planning in terms of, we want to make sure that we put our best face forward. Considering the pictures we've all seen coming out of Charlottesville, the people marching and chanting things like blood and soil and doing Hitler salutes and all the rest of it. The organizers very much wanted to stay away from that in the weeks before. They were, they were telling people not to do exactly those things. Nevertheless, it happened. What was also very high on the organizers' minds was trying to make the other side, the Antifa, the far left people, look as bad as possible. <laughs> As a PR exercise for the far right, it was a disaster. The country watched the largest gathering of the far right in years dissolve into chaos. The air thick with the menace of violence, even before the attack on protesters that killed Heather Heyer. Suddenly, Antifa's tactics took on a new currency. So I've literally got interviews that I recorded with people in, um, in June where we're talking about Antifa and they're sort of shying away from it. And then I talk to them again post Charlottesville and they're proudly waving the banner of Antifa. A broad range of activists now associate with the movement, employing a range of tactics. And among its reach are, I think, sincere Folks, oftentimes young people who, who dox and who loudly confront and will hold their turf, but are very defensive in regard to when they think violence is acceptable. And then you've got a, a, a smaller faction of the Antifa, which are the sort of the real militants. And they're the people who are these days who are talking about actually proactively going out and searching for what they call Nazis or white supremacists. After this summer, voices who believe violence is justified have just grown louder. Is BAM committed to being peaceful? BAM is committed to making sure that we can protect this community. So is that a no then? So, so in Charlottesville, pacifism did not stop the fascists. Armed militias on the right are a frequent sight at protests. Elements on the left are building their own arsenal. And we are actually seeing chapters of particular groups who are about being an anarchist or anti-fascist hard left militia. People like the John Brown Gun Club and Redneck Revolt, for instance. It's an escalating arms race and it's, it's worrisome. Fasten your seatbelts. Every rally, every political gathering is charged with tension, adrenaline, tempers flare. Two Trump supporters now being escorted out of the Boston Common. I just spoke to them a few moments ago. They thought everything would be fine, but suddenly... Here they go. Hey, are you okay? What's your name? With each side on a hair trigger and no leader really in control. I'm frankly amazed that the alt-right and Antifa haven't started shooting each other yet. I'm, I'm 
amazed. I mean, sitting here today, I mean, the, the number, the, the amount of anger, the amount of, of violence going on, the number of guns. In a matter of months, democracy for some has already started looking a lot like war. The question now is how thin the line becomes and how many choose to cross it. All right, next up, a different kind of battle, infighting at Tim Hortons. A simmering feud threatens to boil over, plus the politics of tipping. Restaurants try some different approaches. The television show that challenges all comers is still doing just that, 30 years on. Front Page Challenge is entering its 30th year of broadcasting in Canada. And last night at a glittering reception in Ottawa, they remembered and they celebrated those memorable years. Dan Bjarnison has prepared this report. Few Canadian institutions have lasted as long as Front Page Challenge. And to become more popular year after year is something to be envied. That's the opinion of one viewer at least, expressed over a decade ago and now, after 30 years on the air, the show's more of an institution than ever. Tonight, on Front Page Challenge. Hammered out in 1957 in a producer's living room as a summer fill-in, and in a business where programs fight for breath and often die after a few weeks, Front Page Challenge is one of the most successful TV shows in history. The program developed the look of a miniature history of the 20th century. There was the silly... Uh, no, no, let's not talk about diamonds. Uh, that's a dull <laughs> Let's not let's, talk about diamonds. Let's, let me talk to you about your ex-husband, George Sanders. Are you still friends with him? <laughs> Every time you speak let's about him... Let's talk you're... about diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> there was the profound... Uh, my whole Christian background had a great deal to do with my uh, coming to this conclusion that love and nonviolence should be the regulating ideals in any struggle for human dignity. Perhaps the show's chief drawing card was, until his death, an endearing scamp, Gordon Sinclair. Did the personal event happening to you cause you to feel happy or joy or euphor euphoric? Oop. No euphoric. <laughs> there wasn't an ounce of euphoric in it. <laughs> on occasion, the panel goofed on the obvious. Well, let's see what's left. Uh, Mumbly peg, I guess that they don't do that anymore. Uh, this, uh, this is for you to you run around. It's is it boxing by any chance? No. <laughs> no. no. Swimming, swimming, swimming. <laughs> Not once in four appearances did they manage to guess... Gordy Hawk! Hooray! Oh, no. <laughs> One of the original moderators 30 years ago, Alec Barris today is the program's writer. He recalls some early disasters such as Winston Churchill's son, Randolph. Who was sort of nine sheets in the wind by the time he got to the studio. Went to the wrong studio first, and uh, when he finally got to the right studio, he insisted that somebody go out and get him a bottle of whiskey, which he killed before the show, and he didn't even need it. Then there was the defecting Russian diplomat, Igor Gazenko. And then when he came in, he insisted that he, A, he had to have his voice muffled so it wouldn't be recognizable. B, he had to wear the hood over his face so he wouldn't be recognized. But the funny part came when he saw that Fred Davis was in the makeup room getting makeup on. He insisted he had to have makeup on too, even though he was going to wear the hood. It's hard to imagine now, but the critics panned the show opening night 30 years ago. A corpse, they called it. A long 30 minutes. The critics were wrong. Last night, the taping of a one-hour birthday spectacular. Critics had also predicted that Front Page Challenge wouldn't last after Gordon Sinclair. The critics were wrong again. Dan B. Arneson, CBC News, Ottawa. For most of us, tipping at restaurants is pretty routine. You go out for dinner, you leave something on top of the bill, it's the way we do things. But there's a growing movement to throw all that out the window, not to cheat anyone, but rather to make things a little more even. Alison Northcott has more on the no-tip trip. At this restaurant, no matter how good the service is, customers are encouraged not to tip. So we've decided to include 
uh, the, the tip, which now becomes a service fee, directly in uh, the, the price structure of the menu. To make up for lost tips, staff get a higher hourly wage, at least $15 an hour. The owner says suggested tips on point-of-sale machines lead customers to pay too much, and he wanted to narrow the wage gap between servers and kitchen staff. On the kitchen side, you know, it's very hard, it's a very demanding job, a highly qualified job that we're demanding. But, you know, there's no, there's no margin to pay them adequately. That's been a source of tension in many of the restaurants jean Morissette has worked in, and it makes it hard to recruit and keep kitchen staff. He says this improves things. The idea to get rid of tipping took root in the U.S. a few years ago, and some Canadian restaurants are trying it out too. But it can be a tough sell for customers and staff. Consumers are, are used to uh, tipping. It's, a, it's what we call a social norm. We've always done it, so, so it's a big change for the consumers. What? At this restaurant, servers make most of their money from tips, and phasing them out is not an option. We're obviously against it. Uh, first, it'll be tough to find good waitress and waiter after that point. Uh, the customer service will go down and my f uh, labor costs will go up. Some servers say with built-in tips, they just wouldn't earn as much. I like making tips and working for my own money, says Audrey Poulon. But customers are divided on whether traditional tipping should go. I think it's fair, and if it also includes the kitchen staff in that case, I think that would be really, that's really cool because kitchen is um, underrated. I'm a big believer in definitely always paying them at least like the minimum or even above if you feel that they went above and beyond. No-tip restaurants are still pretty rare in Canada, and some who've tried it have now gone back to tipping. Still, though, some experts say if things go well for businesses like this one, the no-tip reality could gain momentum. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. There's friction in the family, a dispute between Tim Horton's parent company and a group of its franchisees brewing for months is heating up. Disgruntled franchise owners have joined together to fight changes made by new management. And now Tim Hortons is accusing some of them of leaking confidential information and breaching contracts. Our senior business reporter Jacqueline Hansen is here to explain. Jacqueline, what's going on in Coffeeland? Yeah, well, like you mentioned, it's this fight within the Tim Hortons family. And it really started after a new company, Restaurant Brands International, took control of Tim Hortons in 2014. And it made a lot of changes that some of these franchisees were not happy with. And so they formed an association, the Great White North Franchisee Association. And that was in order to sort of stand up against the company. So they allege that it's mismanaging the business. Uh, it's in intimidating franchisees and doing cost cutting measures that put quality of the product at risk and potentially the Tim Hortons brand. And so one of the franchisees even started a class action lawsuit, a $500 million class class action lawsuit alleging that Tim Hortons is is misusing advertising funds. So uh, Tim Hortons denies those allegations, but because it has such a high profile uh, brand, this fight has really become quite public. So what escalated today? Well, Tim Hortons appears to be trying to um, stop the association from making as much noise as it is. So in an email to me today, the company said uh, there is a small group of restaurant owners who continue to breach their license agreements by leaking confidential and competitively sensitive business information to the media. Their actions unfairly and negatively impact all of our restaurant owners, and we have taken appropriate action to protect the brand and our restaurant owners' businesses across the country. And on top of that, the association says that their board members, members have received notices of default, which means that they could lose their businesses. So how does it affect the double-double. Right. That's what we all want to know. Well, but we don't really know yet. So um, is some of the franchisees being concerned about the quality, that's one thing. If some of the owners do lose their businesses and get pushed out, a change of ownership could have an impact. Um, but also because of a change in suppliers, some of these franchisees are concerned about higher costs. And one option for relief of higher costs, of course, would be raising prices in the store. And then that would mean a lot more attention on this. It sounds like a legal fight is brewing there. Thanks, Jacqueline. You're welcome. All right, here's another question to ponder over your next coffee. Why did the chicken cross the road? 
Well, at long last, we have the answer from Shediac, New Brunswick. It's a nice plump brown chicken, <laughs> and it clucks and it scratches and it pecks. I mean, uh, there's not a whole lot you can say about the chicken, although it's getting pretty good at walking across the street. <laughs> Almost every day at one o'clock, this feisty bird belonging to a nearby family takes a walk on the wild side, dodging danger to get to its destination. That's a patch of grass for a snack. And by the way, it doesn't seem a bit interested in a double-double at the nearby Tim Hortons. Okay, stay with us. More on some of the stories we're following for you tonight. I used to bike all the time back home. There goes the town bike, they'd say. Not in that way, the bike was actually shared by everyone in the town. And boy, did I get around. Again, not in that way. This October, the world's greatest gymnasts will face off in Montreal. See the 2017 Artistic Gymnastics World Championships live. Get your tickets now. Before we go tonight, a quick look at some of our top stories. Kim Jong-un gets personal, responding to Donald Trump's name-calling with a colorful insult of his own. It's also a rare statement directly attributed to the North Korean leader, and it came with a threat to escalate the nuclear game of chicken even further. North Korea's top diplomat suggested Pyongyang could detonate a hydrogen bomb in the Pacific. The third installment of the Invictus Games kick off tomorrow in Toronto, and the man behind the event, already here, Prince Harry founded the competition for wounded, injured, and sick soldiers and took the time to meet some of them today. He'll be joined by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and U.S. First Lady Melania Trump for the opening ceremonies tomorrow. 
That is the national for this Friday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Susan Ormiston. Have a great start to your weekend. Thank you.